Hey, hey, now don't worry, it's a dull knife. I'm not going to die now. It really it is very, very dull. So I, I had a lot of people commenting on the last video where they were like, hey, that looks sharp. I mean, it, it does look sharp, but it's not. It is metal though. But unless I like directly impaled this through my head, I'm gonna be fine. Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 list right here on the Daniel Green channel. It's been a minute since I've done one of these and I've read quite a few series, some of which will surprise you, that will now be in my top 10 series of all time. I, uh, I haven't really put many constrictions on here. What I have done is shaken off all worries about trying to appease people who are gonna be mad that some classic isn't on here. This is purely the top 10 fantasy books I've enjoyed or respected the most. I, I have no worry about trying to impress no one no more. We're just going for the real raw Daniel appeal. Give you a good little look into my taste because that's what I try to turn these top 10 videos into. Just a little uptake, a little check-in on uh, what my taste is and how you can compare it to your own so that when you watch my reviews, you watch my hot takes and opinions, you can know how it'll contrast with yourself because nothing I say is fact, it's all subjective. Where's my water bottle? I also made some of that coffee. Quarantine's getting to me. All right, but let's go ahead and kick off this top 10 list with a little bit of honorable mentions. These are just a few I want to throw on out there as being stuff I really love and is worth checking out. Pretty much everything here is going to be on the must read list for me. Um, and I've been working on a video where I literally go over everything fantasy sci-fi related I've ever read. It's surprisingly hard to go back through and remember everything you've ever read in your life. I keep discovering new things and eventually there will be a video on this channel where I go, hey, listen. Here's everything I've ever read. But as of right now, let's go ahead and kick off this list and jump into some honorable mentions. Shall we? We have Wizard of Earth Sea. This was a reread for me this year that made me appreciate it so much more. Ursula K. Le Guin accomplished what she set out to in spectacular fashion. There's something special about reading Wizard of Earth Sea where you as the person consuming it will just have this unavoidable feeling that this is the best possible execution of this idea. And I guess this also takes the award for me. I guess there are also a little bit of awards here, don't know why. For if you're a parent with a kid who needs something to read to them, pick this one up. You can get this big old thick boy here, I'll show you. This is just the complete works of the Wizard of Earth. See, it's a thick chunk. And that should last you at least until puberty. I would think if you're gonna read a little bit of it every night to your child. So go ahead and go get this. I highly, highly recommend it. Le Guin, Le Guin, you're, a, you're an angel of fantasy and I love you. Up next, we have one that's probably gonna be shockingly low for some people and that is Discworld. But I do drool over Discworld. Terry Pratchett, once again, master of what he wanted to make. Discworld is absurdist fantasy in the exact form it needs to be. It would be extremely hard to convince me that another author could do absurdist fantasy as well as is done here. That being said, this has maybe the roughest start of any series I have come to later on than love. The first Discworld book is not reflective of Discworld as a whole, and I plan on making a bunch of Discworld videos in the near future. I just have so much stuff I wanna make. It's kind of hard to even find where to put certain things in. You know what I mean? It's like, where am I gonna fit it? I don't know. That's what she said. <laughs> But look for Discworld books coming down the road. I've read 29 of them, I believe. I might have skipped one on accident. I'm not sure. Uh, and it's it's worth the ride. I don't know if I'm going to continue to read more because there's just so many and I need to read other things. But yes, Discworld in my honorable mentions, for sure. Now on our next one, we have a Napoleonic fantasy that I've had quite a few people pick up on my recommendation and almost all of them have thoroughly enjoyed it. And that would be Powder Mage. If you're interested in a magic system inspired by substance abuse, this might be be for you, <laughs> but more seriously, if you're interested in Napoleonic vibes, themes of warfare and sacrifice, a father-son relationship, and just something that's extraordinarily different for the genre, Powder Mage is gonna be something you're gonna wanna take a look at right there. Brian McClellan has uh, really accomplished something and I can't wait to read more of the Powder Mage. I've only read the first main series, but I've heard that the continuation from there just gets better and better. So I'm excited to pick those up as well. But man, oh man, is Powder Mage worth your time, especially if you want some of the shoot bangs. We're gonna have more guns in this list, but this is probably the most notable shoot bang uh, type fantasy setting out there. This next honorable mention is gonna be one that people are gonna be surprised to see so low because it was in my top 10 last year. And honestly, I wiffle waffle on this one a lot because the ending 
Well, it has an infamous ending. It's so controversial. The fans of the series even are divided whether or not it's pure genius or it's horrible. But all of them agree on the fact that it's ballsy. And that's The Dark Tower. The ending here... We're not gonna get into spoilers. We never do for lists like these, but I, I don't blame people who don't like it, honestly. Like, I get why you can read that and go, that was crud. And I think there are certain aspects of this ending that are not handled well. Uh, the final climax with one specific antagonist, magnificently disappointing. Like, wow, that was flubbed. But on the other hand, it's Stephen King. And there are things done in Dark Tower I can confidently say no other fantasy author is ever going to do. They're not going to do it because Stephen King is very willing to just go, all right, let's just, let's have me in there. It's weird vibes. Dark Tower is not going to be for everybody, but I love it. Man, do I love it. The Coptet, one of the best fellowship fantasies I've ever read. It's just divisive as all hell. And this next one is one that has dropped in my rankings a little bit as well. I still adore it. I think it's one of the best modern fantasy epics out there. It's Lightbringer. <sighs> I think I've finally fallen on that I'm not a fan of the Lightbringer ending. I've really tried to go over it and look at it from all different angles of how can I appreciate what Brit Weeks was going for. But for me personally as a reader, I'm not completely satisfied. That being said, I still really, really enjoyed what he's done here. And I think that Lightbringer as a whole is still worth reading. And I also think there's a good chance you're gonna be one of these people who thinks the ending is extraordinary. But it just wasn't for me. I will go ahead and maintain though, it's one of the best modern magic systems of all time. Some of the best gray characters of all time. Some of the best character development in all of fantasy, period. Uh, Weeks work with character is improving exponentially, it seems, with every book the guy crafts. He is just improving and improving, and whatever he puts out next, again, I will be first in line for. I'm a big Weeks fan. There's, there's dogs barking at each other outside. Okay, we're good. Now let's go ahead and jump on into the actual top 10 list. We had a lot of honorable mentions. I'm sorry about that. I just have a lot to say about fantasy. Big surprise. But at number 10, we have a newcomer to my list, a series I've just started this year, but I will maintain is probably one of the most enjoyable reads of my lifetime in terms of just <laughs> so much fun. And that's going to be The Band, or more specifically, Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose by Nicholas Ames. Nicholas Ames is obviously a friend of the channel here. He's been on repeatedly now, and I enjoy him as a person. But The Band series, soon to have Outlaw Empire as its third entry, is so great. And I'm largely weighting this list by how much I just enjoyed these things. And in terms of blending humor with humanity and having an emotional impact, I've seen Kings of the Wild make people cry from laughing and just tears of sorrow, which is really difficult to do. Blending the spectrum of emotion that Kings of the Wild does, not a simple task, but Nicholas Ames accomplishes it so boldly. I'm such a fan. I guarantee if you're a fan of comedic elements in your storytelling and you read Kings of the Wild, I will put my reputation on the line that Moog will be one of your new favorite comedic characters ever. There is respect paid to the fantasy genre while parodying it a good amount. And then adding this weird idea that just works where the bands are actually like a, a reinterpretation of modern day rock bands from different music eras. That's so strange, but it works so well. Good job, Nicholas. And I, uh, I adore what you're doing there. But let's go ahead and move on to number nine, which is going to be a fantasy series that has fallen a little bit. I can't entirely say objectively, it's just because of the quality of the material, though I have finally finished the series in this last year. It's also just because I'm, I'm having a bit of fatigue of it and the fan base itself has, watching it from like the outside, someone who's not deeply ingrained in this fan base, just go at it. It's been, <sighs> entertaining, to be quite frank. But The Witcher series, still in my top 10. Absolutely just obsessed with Geralt as a character and his relationships. It's so well done. But I am just a bit fatigued. So I think that's why it's kind of dribbling down a little. I'm not taking into account the adaptation. Don't worry. That is still completely separate when it comes to the top 10 fantasy 
series lists. But yeah, Witcher is something I just kind of feel like I'm done with. So while it's entering that part of my mind where I consider it to be iconic for the genre, I am never going to disrespect the material or the characters. I just don't feel the need to discuss it as much anymore because I feel like I've said my piece and if you want to see more detailed thoughts about the Witcher series, go look up my mini reviews or deep dives or character examinations. But yes, I think it is absolutely worth the hype. I am in love with the combining elements of fairy tale fantasy with this gritty realism approach. It totally works. And the lore is some of my favorite in fantasy as well. But beyond that, I've kind of made my peace with it and might be doing some videos on it in the future, but those will most likely be in combination or in complement to other fantasy series videos that I'm working on. At number eight is a series I used to talk about all the time, but have neglected a little bit recently, which has resulted in people asking me if I've even read it or I no longer like it anymore. Am I mad at the author for some reason? Answer to all that. Uh, no, I still love it. I'm not mad at the author and just haven't had a whole lot to say recently. It's amazing how ADD some of my audience is. Yes, Jill and Bastards, still maintain. One of the greatest fantasy series currently in the works. Locke and Jean, some of the best relationships currently in the works. Actually, I would say the best relationship in fantasy right now. King of bromance right there. Locke and Jean, this is the primo primo example. If you want to see an example of what I'm talking about when I say we need to see friendships actually developed in fantasy and not just told people are friends, Locke and Jean right there, 10 out of 10. But I also want to talk about an element to the story that I feel isn't mentioned enough or raised enough here, and that is actually the work with the more minimal magic system and achieving so much success with that in a time where big, bold, fleshed out magic systems to the forefront of your story are so popular. Side note, the expression is fleshed out, not flushed out. Please stop saying that, oh, they really flushed out that character. Flushed means to get rid of or send your poo poo down the tupu tubes pipes through. I don't, what the hell am I saying? But yes, the expression is fleshed out. You are fleshing it out. Stop saying you flushed things away as in you realized them, but that makes no sense. Anyway, it's impressive that the magic system is not super in your face. It's more not even central to the protagonist. None of them can really do much magically. Instead, it's about them as core people and characters living in a dark, awful world, and whenever magic shows up, it's terrifying to them because they don't have any way to counter it. They're just these rapscallions trying to survive and I'm addicted. I'm in. I'm invested. Scott Lynch, he's made something really special here. It's falling again into that category of just extraordinarily different for fantasy, which is something I'm coming to appreciate more and more the better I become read in the genre. I'm looking for things from authors that are just outside the box, really able to grab my imagination in a way that fantasy hasn't before. And Gentlemen Bastards is that. At number seven, I cannot believe what has happened in the course of the channel with these books here. It's going to be A Song of Ice and Fire. And I agree with everyone that the last couple seasons of Game of Thrones weren't up to par. The last season was bad. Uh, it was a totally flubbed ending that's so bad that I, as a mega fantasy nerd who knows a lot of other mega fantasy nerds, does not know a single one of them that is bothering to rewatch the show while they're in quarantine. That's an impressive accomplishment by the showrunners. Good job to flub it that bad. But that is absolutely no reflection on the books themselves. And the people who are now trying to hate on the books because the show didn't end well are dum-dums. Uh, that is just zero excuse for that. The books are still exquisite masterpieces. I get that maybe they're not all of the exact same quality, but Martin's writing on average is still leaps and bounds above most of his peers. And I'm finding more and more people online are starting to crap on the later books and saying they're bad or something like that. No, they're not. I <laughs> just, I know I shouldn't make objective statements like that, but even his most recent, which yes, was released so long ago, but I'm tired of hearing that. So I can't imagine how tired he is of hearing that. But even that one is head and shoulders above most written in the genre. So I'm going to start maintaining that and that's from someone who, when they first started this channel, said some really dumb negative things about A Song of Ice and Fire because I didn't know what I was talking about back in the day. So, man, this, is, this has been a journey. It's been a fantasy epic in itself of how I got here, but I'm here now, and now I'm in A Song of Ice and Fire Defender. Weird. At number six, we have First Law. Joe Abercrombie just continues to enamor me with his character work, but I've talked about that enough, 
So let me talk about some other aspects of his writing that I think are worth note, because I do think I've made a mistake of only praising the character work in his books to the point where maybe it seems like that's the only thing he has going for him, and that's not the case. Yes, his characters are so fantastic that the first book of the First Law trilogy doesn't have a ton of plot for a lot of it. It's just focusing on these characters, and it does such a good job that you're just hooked and intrigued and gripped, grappled, other words. But the reason that works so well is Joe is also a master of working with atmosphere and having a consistent tone go through his entire story. Really, everything here comes together exceptionally well. I would say maybe the weakest aspect of his writing is his work with plot, but most readers aren't so plot-based or focused readers, they're not gonna notice that much because he just makes up for it with every other aspect of his writing. And I think that criticism entirely goes away once you get to his later on books. Yes, I'm reading the first Lost Standalone now. Chill, stop messaging me about it. But yeah, Joe is a master craftsman. Everything he does seems to have this meticulous approach and I'm in love with what the man writes. Not the man himself, I've never met him, I have no idea what he's like. I really have made a mistake of focusing too much on his characters and praising his writing. Really, he's a well-rounded author and I wanna point that out and really hammer it home. There's a couple criticisms you can level at individual books, but I've yet to see a weakness from him as a writer that is consistent throughout his entire bibliography. And his most recent work, A Little Hatred, was so good, I would borderline call it flawless. You cannot like it for subjective reasons, but there is nothing I can think of to point at and say that was a problem with it. At number five, we're in the top five. Uh, these are the real things that I'm gonna be constantly picking up and rereading chapters from all the time, because I just can't get enough. And that number's important for some reason. The Poppy War. Okay, confusion already probably, because I just said this is about books that I enjoy the most, or like I, I think are, you know, the most respectable, and the first one of those two, Poppy War, not the most enjoyable read. And there are criticisms you can level at Poppy War that I think are just true. Uh, it doesn't have the most sophisticated prose. In fact, it borderline reads like YA. Outside of that, though, not many complaints you could have. This is one of the most important fantasy trilogies being worked on currently because of what it's doing for the genre. It's doing a lot different, and that's neat, but these are things I feel need to be done. I'm not saying all of fantasy forever needs to follow down this path. I just think what Rebecca Kwong is accomplishing is important. She is hyper-focusing on the victims of warfare. She refuses to glorify violence, but instead just focuses on the ramifications, the chaos, the evil that will result from the political ambitions of those in power. Yes, many fantasy authors before have gone, we need to do a more realistic look at the results, the aftermath of warfare. Martin's even done it. It's popular to do now, but none have done it as unforgivingly and realistically in my mind as Rebecca Kwong. Still, these authors who are, yes, we need to focus on the ramifications of warfare, will do it from the lens of their protagonists who are not on the front lines. They're not weak peasants. Rebecca is doing that. She's putting you in the position to hear the stories of the people who have gone through some of the most awful things in human history, because this book is largely inspired by real human history. Thank you for driving by without your muffler on, you small pee pee dum dum. I cannot imagine being that selfish and desperate for attention, and that's coming from a YouTuber. I've heard other authors say that what Rebecca is doing will go down in the history of the genre and be something that is discussed in academic circles, and I agree. And I'm sure there are people who have not read these books who are saying, everything you've said been done before is nothing new. Trust me, it hasn't, at least not as graphically as her approach now. I'm not going to insist you'll love these books, I personally do, because I think outside of her just overall goal as an author as really getting this reframing of violence across, Rebecca has also just proved she's a rock solid fantasy author. This would be a total misfire and no one would care about what she's trying to accomplish if she wasn't able to just actually be a great storyteller as well. Her work with character, atmosphere, mythology, world building, magic systems, all prove that she can throw down with the best the genre currently has to offer, even without the lofty ambition on top of trying to make you rethink how violence is written. So overall, super special side note of just saying, well done, good job. I don't know if it'll stay in my top 10 forever, but currently as I'm sitting now as a fan, I just am absolutely appreciating what she is doing. And the fact that she's younger than me and accomplished so much, I'm not jealous at all. I'm not jealous, what are you talking about? At number four, surprising 
nobody who's been paying attention to the channel over the last however many months is Book of the Ancestor. Mark Lawrence won me over with this trilogy and just shot into one of my favorite current working fantasy authors full stop. The man how do you have a sentence that starts your trilogy that is so intriguing that just immediately I go, yep, I'm gonna read this all the way to the end. Probably however many books. I gotta, I gotta go all the way now. You have badass assassin nuns. Did I need to say that again? Assassin nuns. Is it corny and campy and dumb? Uh-uh. It's gritty, realistic, and brutal. If I was going to adapt these books into some kind of adaptation, I would have the violence portrayed in like the Jason Bourne style. That's the vibe it gives off. It's these quick, impactful, deadly assaults on these characters that just, the violence here, it, oh man, it reads well to me. This is the kind of violence I really enjoy reading, which after just talking about the poppy war, seems like a cynical bad thing to say, but you know what I mean? On top of that, Nona, my favorite protagonist I've read in recent memory. Outstanding realization of character. You will be so attached to her because of how well you just can fundamentally know who she is. You're like, yes, this is Nona. She's written in a way where you, as a reader go, I can, before the decision is made, because I know her, her think, oh, she'll do this. Occasionally she'll surprise you because people should be able to do that. But overall, man, uh, the core character there that is never broken, but instead developed upon and grown to a full fledged, oh, wow, one of the best fantasy characters I've come across. And it's not just the main character though. And again, I've made a mistake of only talking about the main character of this story to the point where I think people are probably getting the impression that, oh, if you just are willing to get hooked on one character, this is the series for you, but I need a full well-rounded cast. You're gonna get that here. All the sisters, just so personality filled, punctuating. It's one of these books as well that just has these one-liners where you just like will audibly after you hear it or read it go, ow, that was spicy. Uh, Mark Lawrence is a master of dialogue. He's a master of making characters become clear to you as a reader through what they say and their small mannerisms and their confidence, their behaviors. A lot of authors struggle, even the popular experienced ones, writing dialogue to make a clear image of who this character is to you as the reader. Lawrence seems to be able to do just jump rope with that all day, just having fun, doing a little hop, scotchy pop with, oh yeah, she's gonna say this and that's gonna make you know she's that and imply this and all these subtle things about just mannerisms and by the end of the book you feel like all these people are as well known to you as the cast of friends if the cast of friends were a bunch of nuns who knew how to kill people very 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 well uh, that was a strange path that went down but i'm gonna stand by it so book of the ancestor if you haven't already go check that out go check that out right now go go to your local library and pick it up if it's not there go to a local bookstore you know support local business if it's not there go to go to go to like a big bookstore like Barnes and Noble and try to find it. If it's not there, then go to Amazon. Sorry, that's a lot of driving, but you know, support small local businesses and libraries. Do you guys miss Borders still? That bookstore? I miss Borders. It was great. At number three, we have The Glow Up. Yes, this is the series that has spiked in my top 10 the largest amount from being not on the list at all to number three. And I bet a lot of you can call it. That's right. It's The Dresden Files. The Dresden Files Whew. Oh, The Dresden Files, starring David Schwimmer as Harry Dresden, sure, is the story of a Chicago-based wizard in the modern world going about his life, trying to exist in a world with our modern day problems, taxes, you know, climate change, general chaos. And on top of that, we also have, you know, um, the Fae, vampires, demons, dark lords coming coming at your fool. And originally when I started this, it kind of was like in my head, I was like, oh, it's a pulp detective noir story. And I'm gonna keep it in that lane in my head. And I started like resisting it as Dresden began to evolve. I was like, no, stop trying to grow into something bigger than like a pulp detective wizard story. That's what I really like. And I want it to stay there. But then things happened. The story became borderline. No, it is just kind of epic fantasy in a way. And now I am so ashamed that I ever resisted Dresden growing and shaking off those those little pulp noir genre uh, roots it had. And so already it was probably in my top 10 list. Then I read Changes. Changes is the 12th, I believe, Dresden Files book. And at this point, it skyrocketed from being, oh, this is one of my personal favorite fantasy series to me thinking, no, this is flat out one of the best fantasy series ever written. Harry Dresden might be the best realized character 
the fantasy modern genre has to offer. Yes, you spend 12 books with the first person perspective with him, so he has a lot of time to develop, but you also have to realize between a lot of these books, a year of time passes. So by the time you're at the 12th, 13th, 14th book, you've watched him grow up in a way, and it really lasts with you. It stays with you. Have you seen him mature and grow beyond his young bull-headed roots to his adult bull-headed growth per period. I don't know, what am I saying? There are two types of Dresden fans for me. There's the people who have casually read the first few books and they go, I like Dresden, but I didn't, you know, feel the need to go deeper. And then there's the people who went deeper and they got to the 12th, 13th, 14th book. And they've gone through that whole journey where suddenly you realize this entire cast of characters feels like a family. All of them have their own independent stories going on. And somehow Jim Butcher is able to tell you everyone's story from Harry's perspective, just from him interacting on a casual basis. Suddenly you realize Molly's been off, who you don't even know where she is maybe, but she's been off just growing and changing into a badass, doing her own thing. Don't want to get into spoilers, but it's pretty dark. And just through a few scenes, you really understand the growth of character there. And then from a first person perspective, where Jim Butcher doesn't have that wall of you haven't been able to even follow this person, you experience Harry's growth and it's subtle book by book. There's never a humongous moment except for a couple occasions where he makes drastic decisions where there's a flip switch and the character changes because I usually don't like those moments. It's annoying to me when a character can suddenly just evolve into, uh, into some other thing they weren't before. Harry, don't do that. Harry's a human being. He's a wizard and he's going to live for hundreds of years, but he's a human. There's quotes from other authors who have gotten through the Dresden Files where even they are endorsing Harry Dresden as just one of the best of the modern genre, and I completely and wholeheartedly agree with that praise. It's subtle. I think a lot of people are guilty of writing off Dresden Files because they don't put the time in to really look at what's going on, and I get it because 12 books sounds like a lot, but most of them you can burn through in a weekend. And I am more excited to read the ending of Dresden Files as Peace Talks and Battleground comes out, followed up by the Apocalyptic Trilogy Jim Butcher's been talking about, uh, that I, I, I'm literally like salivating over them. Give them to me! And now, at number two, I'm gonna cheat a little bit, but I feel like people are gonna have a problem with this. At number two, I'm gonna put the Cosmere. The Cosmere as a whole, I am putting into the number two spot, which means Mistborn, Stormlight Archive, Warbreaker. The Cosmere feels largely like a cohesive narrative in several ways to me, because not only are we having these different elements appear in each other's stories, but there's something bigger here. And the more that I go back and reread and experience the Cosmere, the more in my head it is all connected in some way. Obviously, it's not far enough down the road yet, like Stephen King's universe, where you can really see every connection and begin to see the larger interconnecting web, but it's getting there. And so for me, at number two, I'm going to do the Cosmere, because Stormlight Archive, Mistborn, Warbreaker, Elantris, Emperor's Soul even, all of it is just this gigantic tapestry before your eyes. And as you have a clearer and clearer look, you're able to piece it more and more together as the fog fades away. You really can appreciate the larger picture. And so breaking it up in to different spots, one, wouldn't allow me to talk about what I think is one of the most appealing aspects of the Cosmere, and that's that it's an investment into something beyond a single epic fantasy series. Instead, it's a universe that you are going to become lost in, and that is the greatest gift an author can give to you in my mind. That's not even talking about the more detailed things, like how Dalinar's journey in the third Stormlight Archive book is Brandon's best character work to date full stop. I get Kaladin's the fan favorite for a lot of reasons, and he's awesome, he's badass. A lot of people are gonna pick Vin as well for doing full Cosmere, or Kelsier, which I don't understand that one as much. Vin is cooler than Kelsier to me, that's just my opinion. But Dalinar is his masterpiece so far. And if this is a sign of what is to come, Brandon, I think, is really locked and loaded to just blow his fan base out of the water. And we as fans can just feel like among Cosmere fans, you can feel the anticipation. All of us are sitting at what feels like just the beginning of an amazing ride. We've already really enjoyed getting here, and now we're going to spiral off into God knows what direction. Who could ask for more than that? And now, at number one, my favorite fantasy series right now, Pleasure to Read. Before we get into that, I need to have a word from today's sponsor. No, I'm kidding. Today's video is not sponsored. That was funny, though. I will say, before I get into number one spot, I have a number zero spot, which means the one above all, the king, the magnum opus, the one you could all see coming, and that's Wheel of Time. Yes, we're not going to get into it. Wheel of Time, zero, number one, mm, eh, eh, greatest. Ah, 
perfection, greatest fantasy series ever thing, greatest pen ever put to paper, the greatest creation of human creative mind ever, full stop. Anyway, let's go with number one, because we got zero out of the way. <laughs> As soon as I hit number two and it was Cosmere, everyone's like, oh, number one's gonna be Wheel of Time. Now it's not. And I can delay and make you wonder, oh, you're gonna fast forward? Don't you hit that fast. At number one, we have Lord of the Rings. Um, I have picked up Lord of the Rings again within the last few months and gone through it. And I find Lord of the Rings to be something that as I become more knowledgeable in fantasy, which really this last year for me has been an outstanding education, I appreciate Lord of the Rings more and more. Its influence, yes, is something that everyone is aware of, but once you even can put that aside and look at what Lord of the Rings accomplishes within the text, it becomes apparent that while its influence is huge, it's really never been matched. Well, Wheel of Time might have a bigger world with more cultures, or Malazan has entire continents compared to just the one from Middle Earth, it's not really rivaled in a way that's hard to label entirely? Middle-earth is special. And once again, reading Cimmerillion, reading Fellowship to Two Towers to Return of the King, Tolkien, I, I don't know what he did to make Lord of the Rings, but it's art in a way that literature rarely is. From his prose to his vision, it all comes together so beautifully. And I know so many modern readers really struggle to adapt to his writing style. I just need to stress that you got to. You need to read Lord of the Rings because after you finish it, you will understand. I know so many people who have read Fellowship, put it down and go, eh, it's not for me, I can't adjust. And these people, I understand, it's difficult. It is a harder style to read, the same way Asimov now is not exactly the most enjoyable read to go back to. It's drier and it has these weird song breaks, which I'm sure you're absolutely not used to. But I don't know anyone who has gotten to the end who doesn't have a massive appreciation for Lord of the Rings. And I do fully believe that the better read you become within the fantasy genre, the more authors you get under your belt, going back to Tolkien becomes more rewarding. And I'm going to sound unforgivably corny when I say this, and I'm sure people will roll their eyes, but I think Tolkien put a huge chunk of himself in his writing in a way that very few authors ever really accomplish in doing so. I'm not saying authors don't put a ton of effort and work in. I'm not saying authors are uh, not sacrificing, because a lot of them are, to finish their books. But Tolkien did something when he was writing Middle Earth that feels so personal almost. Craig from the Legendarium podcast, I can actually thank for inspiring me to go back to Tolkien this most recent time and elevating it even more so in my thoughts because he was just talking about his praise for The Hobbit in a conversation I had with him and it made me go, I need to go read The Hobbit again. And then I did that and read all of Lord of the Rings once again and it was special. And it's something I'm glad I did at this point in my career as a fantasy book nerd because it just, again, in the third or fourth or fifth, however many times I've reread Lord of the Rings, recontextualized how I view the material. And if you're able to change how I stand on what you've written the fifth time into it, I don't know what's happening, but it's incredible. Now let's talk about the zero spot, Wheel of Time. Woo! Oh man, I've really tangled this knife up. Hold up. Is it bad to be physically attached to a knife? I don't know, maybe. Number zero, my actual personal favorite that I didn't want to make number one because it's a spoilery kind of like, oh, Daniel's going to put that in number one, but I didn't really need to talk about it. This series helped me get through so many rough times in my life, and I plan on making a video fairly soon about how books can be escapes in times when we need them most, and The Wheel of Time has consistently been that my entire life whether it's when my parents split or I had a friend who I found dead, I have always jumped back into the Wheel of Time as a way to process, allow my brain a break from going over the stresses of the real world, and I will forever be grateful for the creative minds behind it because of that. The Wheel of Time, I know as a community, we're kind of divided a little bit, obviously less so than many others, but there is still people angry about various things or at each other's throats over various controversies. For those of you who aren't mega nerds, yes, fantasy nerds occasionally get into it, but I think we all can agree on the sentiment that in terms of being able to just dip yourself in and completely get lost, there is nothing like the Wheel of Time in existence to me. That was a rather 
morbid note to end on. So yes, these are my current top tens right now with the zero spot reserved for Wheel of Time because I love you more than most people. Anyway, like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. Let me know your top tens in the comments down below. Of course, please. I want to see those because if there's a consistent thing in everyone's top ten that I've not read, that's going to make me go, oh my god. I need to read that.